welcome, Hoosier fans, to another victorious episode of the Assembly Call. As tonight we rewatched your Indiana Hoosiers beat North Carolina 63 to 50 to capture the 1981 national championship, which would be IU's fourth national championship so far. Uh, on what was a tense and traumatic day for America, when all of our thoughts and best wishes are with President Reagan and his family. Uh, based on the updates we heard throughout the broadcast, it sounds like they're uh, very optimistic about his recovery after having to undergo surgery uh, after being shot earlier today. Uh, there was a lot of question about whether this game would actually get played. Uh, that seemed to hinge a lot on on Reagan's health, and the NCAA eventually made the decision to move forward with the game. And uh, and from an IU perspective, while we, we certainly are, are thinking of President Reagan, uh, it's an exciting time for IU uh, to win this national championship, to watch this team that has really turned things around after a slow start uh, you, you play so well throughout this entire NCAA tournament run. Uh, and so tonight, after getting the go ahead uh, shot to play uh, just 20 or getting the go ahead to play the game just 27 minutes before tip time, the Indiana Hoosiers defeated North Carolina, as we said, by a 63 to 50 score. Uh, at this point, only UCLA and Kentucky have won more national championships. And as I was alluding to before, this win really brings uh, the season full circle for IU. They're ranked fifth in the preseason, stumbled out of the gates to a nine and seven record. We're seven and five in the in the non conference, and that included a nine point loss at North Carolina. Uh, but IU lost just two times since January twenty second, and they can now claim ownership of one of the most dominant NCAA tournament runs we are likely to ever see, winning the five games by an average margin of twenty two point eight points per game, uh, with tonight's thirteen point margin actually being the closest. I'm your host Andy Bottoms here with Chris Williams and Scott Caulfield, and we're going to break it all down for you on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. And let's start this show the way we start every show, and that is with our banner moment. And for me, this is, I guess, more than a moment, and it even spans both halves. But at the end of the first half, Randy Whitman drained a shot. He got really hot late in the first half, and he hit a shot at the buzzer of the first half to give IU its first lead of the game, and a lead that IU would never relinquish, uh, despite you know going into the locker room with that momentum. Sometimes going in uh, can slow that down. That was not the case at all for IU as uh, they came out, forced turnovers early. Isaiah Thomas with a couple turnovers that led to layups for himself in transition, uh, made a couple other shots. He he scored, uh, I think, eight points really early in the second half, and IU scored on nine of its first ten possessions as they carried over that strong start from the first half into the second half and really never looked back from there. I believe in total a 20-8 to eight run over that time that turned a one-point deficit into an 11-point lead. And North Carolina, I think, wouldn't get back any closer than seven uh, with uh, the for the remainder of the game. So just a really key stretch for IU. They started slow. Uh, bounce back. North Carolina got up 16 to eight, and then IU really ratcheted up the defense and got things going offensively, and just blitzed the Tar Heels coming out of the locker room uh, to really pull away and assert their dominance in the game and, and set the stage for what would be uh, an exciting celebration of this fourth national championship for IU. And our banner moment tonight is brought to you by some company named Homefield Apparel. Now, look, you may not have ever heard of Homefield Apparel, and that's okay. We're here in 1981, and Homefield apparently isn't going to even be founded for another 37 years. But some guy by the name of Hitchcock reached out to me earlier this week and told me about a premonition that he had, which involved his future grandson founding an, something called an online apparel company, whatever that is. And I was like, okay, sure, crazy old man, but he paid me a dollar to run the ad, so we said, okay. Uh, this old guy was talking about all kinds of crazy stuff, like the Cubs, Red Sox, and White Sox all winning World Series, the New England Patriots becoming the greatest NFL dynasty of all time, and O.J. Simpson being accused of murder. This guy's crazy, but I had really insane stuff with no reasonable chance of happening. But the apparel thing still sounded interesting, so he claimed his grandson would graduate from IU and then found a company that would have the most comfortable t-shirts and hoodies available anywhere and that they're going to have old IU logos that haven't been seen in decades. For example, apparently they're going to bring the bison back, which Indiana hasn't used in over a decade after discontinuing it in 1969. Anyway, apparently it's going to be incredible, and he had some more gibberish that he wanted me to tell you, and he said it was very important for me to be precise and for you to write this all down. So go to homefieldapparel.com. What does dot com actually mean uh well i guess if you figure that out then you're supposed to use the promo code assembly 20 to get 20 percent off look none of this makes sense to me either but hopefully it will at some point 
All right, now it's time to move the ball, find the open man, and get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team, which tonight we'll start with Chris Williams. Chris, uh, what are your thoughts on this 13-point IU National Championship victory? Well, you know, it's um, it's interesting because I, I was uh, thinking about what Coach Knight would say at the end of this game, and it was probably going to be very similar to the fact that um, it, a slow start has kind of uh, been the Achilles heel of this team all season, but we saw that early on. We saw um, a team that was, you know, really rushing their shots, really not able to penetrate the zone, that one three one zone and, and variations of it that UNC was throwing at them. But a, a team that just came out and dominated the start of the second half, those first five minutes, um, Indiana went on a 12-4 run uh, and had a lead of nine uh, and really never looked back from that, from that point on because they finally were able to get – UNC to make uh, the same ill-advised shot selection that Indiana was making the first half kind of flipped the script a little bit. And uh, Randy Whitman just, you know, got red hot in the first half, first half, obviously had, as you mentioned, the the shot at the end of the first half to kind of uh, uh, put Indiana ahead by one and really kind of set the tone for, for what they wanted to do going into half. But that, that, that opening stretch of the second half uh, just was, was the game. Um, Al, Al McGuire talked about it. Uh, you know, there was a lot of things that I thought he said that I kind of scratched my head on, but there was, he made a lot of good points. And that was the big one that uh, the first few minutes of that second half was, was the, was the reason Indiana won the game. And, and um, it was amazing to see the defensive tenacity really ramp up and Indiana was forcing UNC and even their leading scorer like Al Wood to make shots uh, or, you know, shoot shots that were not the kind of shots that they wanted. And it really got frustrating for UNC you could see because they began to commit fouls and uh, and and force you know Indiana to go the foul on when Indiana was just trying to run down the clock uh, halfway through the second half on each possession. So uh, really impressive second half after a really sluggish start for the Hoosiers. Definitely was. And uh, now let's throw it to the final member of our team for tonight's postgame show, Scott Caulfield. Scott, what are your thoughts on uh, tonight's big victory? I mean, fourth banner. This is awesome. I have a hard time putting it, you know, kind of into words. So I'll just say this, you know, I'll just say, this is it. Make no mistake where you are. This is it. Don't be a fool anymore. Sorry, just, you know, hearing that for 25 straight minutes got me fired up. No, I mean, dude, this is our fourth title. This is fantastic. Second title under night. What, you know, only six years removed from his first from his first title to Indiana. This is just fantastic. To echo some things Chris said, I mean, You know, first half, we did not play very well. You know, if I was, like, let's say I was playing Pong and I got down, like, 3-0, I would definitely restart my Atari and go over again. Like, the same thing would happen if they ever made a basketball game. I would do the same thing here as I restart this game because this game just did not start well for us. But you saw the great defense that we had, the fact we had great help defense. Again, Isaiah showed just how, how quick he is that, I mean, he was cheating everything, but he could do it because he could basically go down to the post. He could double anybody who didn't have, like if, if his guy didn't have the ball, he was doubling because he'd always get back to his guy in time. Um, you know, I, I think we'll talk about all the, you know, Isaiah had a great game. We'll definitely talk about Landon Turner. He was fantastic. You mentioned, you know, Whitman was great. But I think Landon Turner in the first half was also a key part to a spot where we went from down 20 to 14 to bring it back to 20 to 20. Um, but, you know, the other thing, too, that kind of that, 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 you know, stuck for me was in that second half, you know, Chris was saying that UNC took some ill-advised shots in the first half. I agree. In the second half, they had a pretty good amount of mid-range shots that were open. They just didn't hit. And I think that, you know, we were playing good defense, but their inability to hit mid-range shots and our ability to hit those and then play great defense um, really made the difference. But, I mean, you know, again, our hearts go out to what's happening in Washington tonight, but – a great win. I mean, our fourth title, the spectrum's ours, baby. I mean, the spectrum's ours. We own it. I agree. Just play all the play all the games there. Uh, yeah. I, that, that seems like the way to go. I mean, you, you talked a little bit about IU's defensive effort, uh, Scott, and this was, if not for a, a late uh, putback by Sam Perkins, I believe, with just a few seconds left, IU would have held its third straight opponent in the tournament under 50 points. As it was, Carolina only ended up uh, scoring 50 in total, but the the defensive effort from IU, they really extended, tried to force North Carolina to put the ball on the floor uh, and did a good job of jumping passing lanes and, and really 
it put them under a lot of pressure. Now, one of the the byproducts of that pressure was Ted Kitchell picking up three fouls really early uh, in the game, which um, – you know, he didn't play any more at all after that. I think he had three fouls in four to five minutes and and never saw the floor again. Uh, you know, so so there are a couple guys to talk about here. We'll we'll definitely get back to Isaiah, but one of those was Jim Jimmy Thomas. I mean, he 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 wasn't the first guy off the bench when uh when when Benson went out. Steve Risley came in, made a nice tip in for actually first I IU's first field goal. Uh, but, but Knight switched over and put Jimmy Thomas in the lineup toward the end of the first half. And I don't think he ever came out for the rest of the game. Uh, he, he played really well dished out. Uh, I believe it was eight assists on the game, uh, made a, made a jumper not long after he went in, had four rebounds, uh, and, and a steal just, just really played well as an unsung guy off the bench. Uh, you know, Chris, I, I talk a little bit about what you saw from him and, and the impact of, his play in this game for a, a guy that, you know, they talked about IU's bench being better, um, but maybe a, a somewhat unsung guy uh, coming into this game. Well, you hit the nail on the head because, you know, uh, Ted Kitchell goes out, really doesn't, you know, doesn't really play any kind of role in this game. And Indiana only goes six deep. And I thought it was interesting because at the beginning of the game, Al McGuire and Billy Packer were talking about Indiana having the deeper bench could go 10 or 11 deep. And we really only go six deep uh, for the whole game. And I thought that was interesting because uh, they were talking about UNC being the team that didn't have the depth, but Jim Thomas comes in and really in a lot of ways contains Al Wood because Al Wood was being guarded by Landon Turner for most of the first half. And then they switched for much of the second half. And you saw Jimmy Thomas, being being placed on the bigger uh, Al Wood, who, who's about six foot six, and I thought he played tremendous, and he did. He played really. He's played really good all tournament, and he's kind of been the guy off the bench that is has been kind of the unsung hero defensively. He's not a scorer, um, but he came in and did the things, the little things that needed to happen, especially handling the ball. Because when UNC started to trap, especially in the second half, he you know, they needed his ability to get the ball in the right position to kind of play that, you know, that chase game that they were doing half court where they're just trying to run down the clock. And I thought he, he played tremendous, um, you know, and you look at what he contributed in addition to, uh, you know, guys like Thomas and Randy Whitman and Tolbert who all play 40 minutes. I mean, he, he, he you could tell that Kitchell was, didn't have a role in this game, even if he came back in and didn't commit any fouls. I think he was out of place to start the game. And defensively, I don't think he brings the same thing to the table as an undersized Thomas, but Thomas has the leaping ability that, that Kitchell doesn't have. And that's a huge asset here in this game. Yeah, I think what you said about giving IU another ball handler, they were able to move Isaiah off the ball a little bit more uh, at times. And, and really having three ball handlers, the, the broadcasters brought that up at some point when North Carolina would run to more of their traps and things like that, having three guys that you felt really confident handling the ball, uh, all of whom brought the ball up at various times in, uh, in both you know, Jimmy and Isaiah Thomas and then Randy Whitman, uh, I thought was, was really critical. And your point on, about his defense on Wood was a good one. Uh, matchup wise, it was a little bit difficult where you've got Carolina's, uh, top scorer coming off of a 39 point game without a real natural matchup for IU, given the lineup that they've been starting uh, in, in this one. Scott wanted to throw it to you just to to give some thoughts on on Jimmy Thomas and uh, what he what he brought. He had played well in the LSU game as well, so came in with some confidence. But uh, again, a guy not really counted on to score, but does a lot of the little things really well. What's amazing is. You know, Knight only played seven guys in this game. One of them was Ted Kitchell, who you mentioned, who got three fou- three fouls in four minutes and then never played again and was a starter. So when you talk about like the bench, like the bench stepping up, it's like they basically played six guys the entire game for a national championship game, which is just bonkers. But no, Jim Thomas came in, played great. Risley came in, played great. Um, you know, th- having those multiple ball handlers, and I, I don't want to keep on going back to Isaiah, but you know, I know you set me up for Jim Thomas, but the thing that w- was amazing to me about, you know, all these guys, but definitely Isaiah was just the poise that they showed. You know, Isaiah was not having a good game in the first half. They were coming and trapping him, but he really let the, he let, he let the game come to him. And, you know, he let Whitman bring up the ball, let Thomas, you know, handle the ball more, where I think, you know, some other point guards might have been like, all right, I need, the, I need to get the ball. I need to, you know, get it in my hands. He really kind of led the offense at times from being off the ball, which I thought was a really, you know, very, very um, advanced thing for a, a sophomore to be playing like that. 
Yeah, I'd say it was the other guy that I, I really wanted to hit on uh, before we got too far into the show. Uh, I mean, can't so, wait for him to come back for his junior year. It's gonna I, that's going to be yeah, that's going to be great. When you think about who's who's back from this team, you only lose Ray Tolbert, um, who you know played forty minutes as well and, and grabbed eleven rebounds. But yeah, it's exciting to think about what this team might look like. Uh, it, you know, you go to Isaiah, he was one out of seven, I believe in the first half from the floor ends up seven of 10 in the second half, uh, finishes a game with a, a game high, 23 points, five assists, four steals. Um, and, and really they used, I thought night, it was interesting how he used him, used him off the ball as we talked about, but also, you know, putting him kind of in the middle of the zone, uh, when, when North Carolina would be there, they talked about on the broadcast night trying to put him at the free throw line and and put him in positions to play uh, so chris were you surprised at all about the way that that knight deployed uh isaiah in this game uh certainly the results uh speak for themselves but uh you know just just thoughts on you know kind of what you expected coming in versus what he actually uh was how he was used in the game itself well the, the theme all season is kind of letting isaiah be isaiah no matter what he's kind of been unrestrained and that's un- unique for knight because he's not historically been someone that has led a player regardless of their ability kind of run the show they way the way they want to and you could see it at times when they were in the half court set the motion offense was not moving like it would traditionally it wasn't a pass in a, in a quick cut there were times where the the floor was much more spread out which I thought was interesting and you kind of saw uh, Isaiah trying to to orchestrate what he wanted to see on the floor. But I think, I think a lot in the first half, Isaiah forced way too many shots. I mean, he was one of seven from the field in the first half. And I think you, you expected something different in the second half. I mean, he didn't, you know, he took over the game tonight in a way he didn't against LSU. I mean, in the LSU game, Landon Turner was the star and Isaiah actually didn't even play. He only played like 29 minutes in that game, but tonight he plays all the minutes and even, you know, he, he committed some ill-advised turnovers, but he was backing up players. He was playing at, at the position where kind of in the center of that zone. And he was doing things that I think Knight just trusted him uh, to do what he needed to do. And I think that he had the ability to get himself into positions where he was forcing UNC to foul him and get him to the line or try to force a turnover. And again, you could see in the first half, Isaiah forced a couple shots. He forced some ill-advised passes, but he really settled in. And you could see it in the, in the beginning of the second half where he had those two steals converted to easy baskets. I mean, that's where he's his best is in transition. And, and you could see if those are if those things are going well for Indiana, they weren't going to lose the game. Yeah. Well, you could see you could see him, you know, messing up the North Carolina's defense because Dean Smith, who again, like the guy can't win the big one, um, but you know, he would come in and like he wanted to play, you know, traps and zone. But every time they started trapping or they played zone, Isaiah would go to the middle. If they got the ball to him, like he would immediately drive it and then just kick it to Tolbert or Turner, and it'd be a score. So like. And in North Carolina didn't seem to want to play man to man the entire game. They don't do that normally, but they didn't want to. And then every time they tried to get out of it, we would just Isaiah would torch them, and they had to go back into it. And so you could tell they were totally messing up the defense. North Carolina wanted to come out with. Well, and UNC tried to speed them up, and when they did, you know, you can yeah. see it at the at, in the first half and at the very end of the game in those half court, you know, or the full court when they were trying to trap and speed them up. You could see Indiana was out of their element, but. As soon as Indiana got to the half court set and just started moving the ball around, it was over because no matter what UNC did, if they put them on the foul line, I mean, Indiana, you know, they only missed five foul shots all, all night. So it wasn't as if you, you were going to put a really bad free throw shooting team on the, on the, on the line. Indiana was going to convert them. Yeah, just a, a handful of plays from Isaiah to touch on briefly. Picked up a, a key third foul on James Worthy toward the end of the first half where uh I think I think it was Billy Packer didn't didn't love the call, um, but did kind of get run over by Worthy. That was a big one. And and really when he wasn't taking the best shots in the first half, he did get himself to the free throw line a few times and uh managed to make some big shots there. Then there was a play toward the beginning of the first half. He had made that steal at the beginning. Then there's another play IU kind of breaks through, gets it to him in the middle of the floor, feeds it to Landon Turner for an easy layup. Uh, that was a that was a big play. And then a couple of when they would spread North Carolina out back cuts, there was one where it just seemed like I think it was Jim Thomas threw a pass, seemed like it was going to go over his head, but he just reached out, snagged it and laid it in uh, toward the end of the game to really just push the lead a little bit further. And so just, you know, a guy that you watch and, and 
it's it's exciting to think about what he can become because he's already um, you know putting him in a position to make those kinds of plays, but just makes things look so easy uh, out there as 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 you go through. Just an exciting guy uh, to watch, and uh, and I'm sure we'll talk more about him as we go. Uh, but uh, for now, let's uh, let's take a quick break. Uh, we'll uh, we'll get back to to the game here in a second. Uh, we're going to take a break. Continue the breakdown of IU's win over North Carolina. And uh, we'll point out the meaningful moment you might have missed and go inside the numbers to highlight the most important statistical notes from the game. If you're listening to The Assembly Call, stick with us. This is Jordan Halls, and I never miss a shot or an episode of The Assembly Call. You are listening to The Assembly Call IU Postgame Show. I'm Andy Bottoms here with Chris Williams and Scott Caulfield, and we are talking about Indiana's national championship game victory over North Carolina by a final score of 63-50. to And it's time for today's meaningful moment that you might have missed. Uh, there were a number of, of games here. This is probably just going to... It maybe there, there's a we'll, we'll get some more Jim Thomas moments. I'm gonna uh, wanted to get to uh, to a play um, from from Randy Whitman here toward the end. Um, it gets you know, we talked about the play before the uh, before the before the half, but a few other big plays from him really toward the the end of the first half got IU going and and he was a big part of that. He made I think at one point hit jumpers on three out of four straight possessions. And that was really a time that North Carolina had, you know, taken the lead up to sixteen to eight. I'd gotten back in it, and Whitman had started to put them over the top in, in those in those situations. Uh, we talked about putting Isaiah in a position to make plays, and he was both he and Jim Thomas were doing a really good job of giving Whitman the ball, particularly against the zone. Um, really excelled from the baseline and and from the wing. Just made a number of big shots that gave IU some offensive momentum in in a half where, as we've talked about before. They really struggled to to take good shots, the kind of shots that they wanted to take. But I thought Whitman really settled them down by getting some shots to go in the basket, and and he scored I think about half of his points uh, in the last few minutes of the first half overall for the uh, for the game. I think he had eight uh, the latter part of the first half out of his sixteen for the game. Uh, so so Chris, you know, this was just kind of a way to talk about Whitman's performance a little bit quieter in some ways, wasn't as flashy as Isaiah and. Uh, maybe not as unexpected potentially as what you saw out of Jimmy Thomas, but uh, just another solid game from Whitman. And I thought his shooting toward the end of the first half really turned things around for IU. Yeah. You heard the announcers kind of, you know, they were gloating over Whitman tremendously uh, as, you know, uh, Al McGuire was, and, and he and, uh, and Enberg were both, uh, you know, allotting his shooting ability. And, and it took a while for, for Whitman to get going. I mean, who would have thought that Steve Risley would have the first field goal for Indiana? I mean, it was pretty shocking. Uh, you could put money on that and, and, and <laughs> win a ton on on that bet. But you know, he got settled in and he hit he hit those those mid range shots, which he, which is you know in the corners, like, you know that's that's what he's expected to do. And he and, you know he shoots fifty four percent from the field, and it wasn't flashy. It was just it was him you know doing what he's done all season and, and hitting key shots at key moments and being that dagger where, you know, the, the, you know, the opponent is inching back and, and you look at, you know, UNC gets within seven um, about the eight minute mark and, and Whitman's going to come back in and, and hit another dagger, hit another jumper to, to kind of seal it back up again and, and increase the lead. And, and, and he was the guy that, you know, he played all 40 minutes, you know, and you think that toward the end, his legs were going to kind of, you know, go out from under him as, as it does, if you're going to play every minute, but he was rock solid. And, you know, you know, a guy like that handling the ball a lot too is, is, is something you wouldn't expect to see, but it, he just played tremendous. I mean, he only had two turnovers. Um, wasn't a huge factor inside rebounding, but his, you know, he hit key shots when he had to, and that's what you expect after out of, out of a guy. And I know now I had a lot of confidence, confidence in him on the floor. Yeah, I thought one of the other you know, he did grab some some big rebounds late, and they they showed a, a lengthy exchange between Knight and Whitman uh, toward a little bit toward the end of the game. IU was on a you know on a run and showed them talking to each other on the sidelines. I think that was another one just 
clearly a conversation between uh, a couple of guys who really had great respect for each other and what they were talking about. I think Knight even took a timeout shortly after that to you know sort some things out with the rest of the team based on whatever he and, and Whitman had talked about. Uh, Scott, thoughts on uh, the performance from Randy Whitman tonight? I mean, again, uh, not not one of the guys that we really brought up hardly at all in the first segment, but was second on IU's team and scoring with 16 points. Yeah, I mean, the again, it's that mid-range shooting, and his shooting ability is fantastic. I look at one section in the first half. North Carolina's up 20 to 14. You know, things are not going that well. Whitman hits a two. You have a great defensive play by Landon Turner. Um, you have a great pass by Isaiah to get a Turner dunk. I'm assuming, um, because NBC was using, I guess, what we call the scoreboard cam, where the camera's like from the scoreboard angle. Um, and then the next play, we have a good defensive stop, and then Whitman hits another two. So it's, you know, six points there, four for Whitman, one, two for Landon Turner, which really got, got the game back to 2020. Um, just a side note here, like a lot of really crazy angles out of NBC tonight. They had the baseline camera. They had the sideline camera. They had the under the scoreboard camera. They'd switch in the middle of plays. Um, NBC was very excited about the new cameras they had out, and their producer was very, very proud of changing those up, which made a very fun watch. Um, but no, I mean, I think that was a key point because we're down by six in the first half. Things are not going right. Isaiah's not playing well. And, you know, Whit- Whitman helps get us back there with Landon Turner. The two of them get it to 20 20. We kind of stay nip and tuck throughout the rest of the first half. We go into halftime up by two, I believe, one or two. And then he comes out and hits those shots in the second half. So, I mean, it, it, he was the one who kind of held the tide over until Isaiah picked it back up in the second half. Yep, agreed. When things were going well, the defense really kept IU in early, and then Whitman shooting turned it around, and then Isaiah just took over at the beginning of the half. One of the other plays, this was, uh, I guess, one that people probably wouldn't have missed because it was so late in the game. Uh, but, you know, IU had turned the ball over, as uh, as you guys talked about before, and, and really allowed North Carolina not to get it to be where anybody was uh, too terribly worried, but they did get it to eight uh, with just under two minutes left, had some turnovers, missed free throw. Uh, and Ray Tolbert came up with a really big steal for IU. And, and really at that point, uh, I think it was, uh, Risley came down, made two free throws. Isaiah made two free throws. Tolbert made two free throws. And really that, that brief stretch right there really put the game away, uh, from the free throw line. But, but, you know, we didn't talk a ton about Tolbert. He made a, you know, he only made one field goal for the game, which was a really nice bank shot, uh, in the first half, but did grab those 11 rebounds, played solid defense inside. Uh, I believe he hit a free throw to tie it early uh, at some point late in the first half as well after a, a really strong offensive rebound from, uh, from Jimmy Thomas. But, you know, Tolbert, it was interesting as they, as he came out, um, when they introduced the starting lineups, uh, you know, Knight talked about him, you know, just how important he had been. I think said he, uh, I think Enberg relayed something there. Knight said he should have been Big Ten Player of the Year or something, something to that effect, and really talked about how well Tolbert had played. Um, you know, didn't show up huge in the scoring column, but really did a lot of the little things and had the steal uh, to ice it. Uh, Scott, any any other things that you saw from from Tolbert uh, in the game tonight? No, I mean it's funny you mentioned that steal. That's the last thing I kind of have on my notes here at the end, the end of the game is that steal was huge. I mean that that steal saved the game, and it shows. He was, he was also really good, I think, at the beginning. He was good throughout, but he was good at the beginning of the game as well. Um, but, you know, that stretch with about four minutes to go, you are right. North Carolina got closer. I think a lot of us might remember as we look back on this game, maybe even the history books, you know, I don't know, in like, you know, 30, 38 years from now, maybe someone will do some kind of, I don't know, like a radio show with people talking about something. They probably have to be like, you know, sequestered because of a virus. I don't know. I'm, I'm talking out of my butt here. But – no, I mean, that's from as that crazy as that right? that uh, home field apparel yeah, that thing that was on here. Dot com. I mean, yeah, I mean, crazy. it's like, what are you going to put? What are you going to put in front of there? An HTTP, a semicolon, like two backslashes. What are you talking about, bro? Um, but under four minutes, what you did notice is like the I wrote down like the offense looks sloppy. We had tur- two tur- two turnovers in a row. We missed a couple front ends of, of free throws. But the notes that I made is like. Having this good of a defense is a backstop that does help cover up those mistakes. In the second half, as well as we played, our offense still went through spurts where this didn't look that good, but our defense really stepped up, and that Tolbert steal was kind of the, the icing on that cake. But like having a great defense where you're able to have guys like Isaiah Thomas cheat back and then come back to their guy – allows you to kind of be a little frenetic and maybe not doing as well on offense. It's just, it's such a great backstop to always have that defense. 
Yeah, defensively, they I, they really the turnover number got a lot closer uh, toward the end of the game because you didn't take great care of it late. But it was, I think there was an inbound play, and it was North Carolina had seventeen turnovers, and IU had just seven, uh, and those were really uh, those were really really big, you know, big for IU to really gain control of the game in the second half. Um, I'm going to turn the rest of the meaningful moment you might have missed into a, a Jimmy Thomas appreciation segment here. Uh, there were a number of plays when he came in. Um, that he just kept possessions alive and, and did some really big things. It was a, I've got in my notes here, a, a big rebound from him uh, almost immediately after he came in. I think it was a defensive rebound. The Whitman goes down, hits a jumper to tie it at 20. He had a deflection that stopped a fast break late in the first half when IU was uh, still down two. Uh, he made a really acrobatic rebound off of a Whitman miss uh, that eventually led to Ray Tolbert making a free throw that tied the game. Uh, and then it was 45 to 38 after a tip in and he had a really nice pass um, to Randy Whitman for a layup that that really, you know, again, North Carolina put a little bit of pressure on maybe maybe make had a chance to make it close if IU doesn't score makes a really good pass one of his eight assists in the game for that I, I just thought he did a lot of the little things well uh in, in the game and it was it was interesting you know Billy Packer or not Billy Packer Enberg made a comment when Mike Pepper got inter- introduced about the uh about kind of the importance of role players or, or complementary players or something like that uh, and so, you know, I thought it was funny that he made that comment about somebody else, but I thought it was really Jimmy Thomas who came in and made a lot of those kinds of, uh, complimentary plays over the course of the game tonight. But, uh, Mike talk- Pepper, he symbolizes the spirit of the complimentary player. Yes. I wrote that I, down. Uh, yes. Great. That was, uh, that was Dick Enberg. That's the so, nicest way of saying so, oh, this explain. guy is a complete bench player who shouldn't be starting in the national championship game. Yeah, he was when you look down the rest of the North Carolina starting lineup, there was a clear outlier and that outlier was Mike Pepper. And that's why he gets that comment uh, about uh, from from Enberg there. But uh, Chris, any any other moments uh, that you jotted down as you were as you were watching the game that you wanted to touch on? Well, I just nothing specific, but I just think I keep coming back to that stretch in the second half where, um, you know, we got really lazy with the ball. I think it was about the four minute mark. We had two, two turnovers and four possessions. I think what I wrote down, I could be wrong on the timing, but it, we came down after committing turnovers and our D was shut, was shut down defense. And it seemed to me, you know, if you look at, at, at UNC, they only went nine for 25 in the second half. I mean, we, we did not let them have any easy scoring baskets. I, I made a comment to the fact on, three different possessions when the ball went down to James Worthy or Sam Perkins, the ball got so down low beneath the basket that Tolbert and and Landon Turner basically gave them no window whatsoever, except this kind of like sideline under underneath shot that had no chance of going in. And even Billy Packer and Dick Enberg kept commenting about how that was such a poor uh, choice of a shot because of where they were. But I just thought that, you know, you know, the defense, specifically in the first five minutes and in and, and about the six minute mark were tremendous because UNC, as you said, kept inching back and the defensive uh, tenacity that we provide, especially down low was, was tremendous. Yeah, it was uh, those plays that you mentioned were, that was one of the few good things to come from that baseline camera angle was you, you saw they were basically for, forcing Perkins to catch the ball almost behind the basket. He shot it into the underside or the backside of the backboard once at, uh, essentially resulted in a turnover and then had a couple other shots where he was just trying to flip it there and just didn't have an angle uh, to do it. So despite the fact that Carolina had some you know, really tough players inside, IU forced them to catch the ball in positions that were really uh, difficult ones for them to make plays and uh, and really caused them some struggles there. Well, the things I'll say about w- between Turner and um – uh, oh, uh, Tolbert. I mean, you're right, Chris. Like they, they were so good, big, athletically, defensively. I had this moment. I guess the last moment I'll say at the end, in the middle of the second half. Um, you know, with 45 to 38, UNC has to do something. They start double teaming, and then like in that play, we hit Whitman for an easy layup. They try and see, get the ball down. Like I even wrote down, like I'm not sure what North Carolina could do at this point. Like they can't gamble on defense. Um, but if they don't put pressure, they're just uh, each of our possessions are going to last like a minute. Like the next time down, they stop putting pressure on us, and so then we just ran a minute possession. And Chris is right; like we got a little bit sloppy with the ball, but then our defense was so good on the backside, North Carolina couldn't do anything. So you kind of had this point with like eight nine minutes to go. It's like I'm not sure 
how North Carolina gets to the finish line to beat us at that point because they can't really pressure us on defense, um, but they can't sit back and do nothing, and they also have no real options to, to effectively score. Yeah, it was a, a. It did kind of feel like at that point they were throwing every trick in the book that they had at IU, and nothing was really working defensively, and and it just seemed like eventually if they, you know. If IU wanted to, they had back cuts or other ways to get easy baskets no matter what North Carolina did. There just weren't answers uh, from North Carolina defensively as we went through there. So, all right, let's uh, let's go inside the numbers just a little bit. I think we've touched on uh, a number of these things. If, if you look uh, from a shooting perspective, IU for the game shoots uh, just about 48%. Uh, Chris mentioned the free throw shooting earlier. IU 17 of 22 from the line at 77%. Uh, made more free throws than their opponent attempted. North Carolina was just 10 out of 16. IU wins the rebounding battle 31-29. Hoosiers with more assists and fewer turnovers. I mean, really, almost every number that you look at here points in in IU's favor. You know, the one thing that we haven't talked a whole lot about, uh, we we talked a little bit about the Kitchell foul trouble, but 40 total fouls called in the game. Um, It just seemed like... They really, the referees really, and, and the commentators talked about this a lot toward the beginning, really came out and seemed to want to call a tight game. IU had five fouls, I think, within the first four minutes of the game. Uh, and, and I did think at, at times the officiating made it hard to get a little bit of flow in there. So I guess I'll, I'll shoehorn some, you know, a way to get thoughts about the officials in here. But I definitely thought there were some questionable calls at times there and, and some quick whistles on touch fouls that didn't really impact the game uh at all scott you seem like a guy with strong opinions about officiating uh why don't you uh any thoughts that you had for the uh for the stripes tonight no i'm good no no i I totally agree um no they were calling tons of fouls i wrote down in my notes the second half you know turner uh landon turner got his fourth foul with six minutes to go worthy got a weak fourth foul with like seven minutes to go both of their fifth fouls i'm a homer Landon Turner's fifth foul was not a foul. Like he had a block. He barely touched the guy. Like that was a block. And then Worthy's fifth foul was not a foul either. And I would love to have Worthy foul out, but it's like, you're going near the end of the game here. You got guys with four fouls, like let them earn their fifth foul. Don't just give them a touch foul on a block where you bump into somebody after you block the ball. Um, But no, they, they were calling it really tight down low. Um, But what's also nuts is even with that, you still have an Indiana team that only played seven guys and you have a North Carolina team that basically played six. Um, so, you know, I, I would give credit to the players for kind of playing under the, the constructs of what the refs were putting out there. But I agree. It made the game kind of choppy and weak. And at the end, it's like, great. So we lose Landon Turner and James Worthy. Like that's an awesome way to end the championship is getting two of the better players out there just off the court for like basically nothing fouls. Yeah. Chris, any uh, lingering officiating thoughts from you? You know, I th- we we looked at the the uh, touching of the rim situation, which I thought was comical, and I, obviously, I hope that 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 uh, the, you know the NCAA in the future will will remedy this absurdity about players playing above the rim or interference. But I th- I thought that was comical, but. I thought early on, I thought there was neither team really had a chance to get, as you said, Andy, kind of in any kind of flow. Um, you know, I did not expect Kitchell to get three fouls called him. I thought the the second one was a little chippy. The last one, I, I just think it was interesting the way they were calling the over and back or the over the back, um, you know, positioning fouls because I thought those of all of, all of them were the most absurd uh, because it, it, you know if you have a taller per- person on the outside, if he has the ability to get the ball and he's not making contact, it shouldn't be a foul. So I, I thought that I, that was interesting. I, the one thing I look at with the foul situation is thankfully a guy like Ray Tolbert who played every minute, he had zero fouls. And I think if, if he had gotten into foul trouble instead of a Kitchell, Ted Kitchell, I think it would have changed the whole dynamic of the game in a lot of ways because you have James Worthy and Sam Perkins who are now able to go inside and you have a guy like Landon Turner, who's been foul prone all year, having to to contend with both of those guys, and that could have changed the whole outlook of the game. Yeah, that's great that's point. yeah, that is a great point. Uh, I would I would totally agree. Uh, as we look at other stats, you look at the shooting. I mean, shot distribution for IU: thirty of the shots, uh, thirty of the forty eight field goal attempts were from uh, Isaiah Thomas and Randy Whitman. Uh, those guys, you know, both played forty minutes. Uh, let IU in scoring, let IU in shots. 
Um, not not terribly surprising there. We've we've touched on how, the, how many guys played the uh, the entirety of the game. I uh, wanted to talk Landon Turner really fast, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, about him here statistically. Ended up with 12 points. I think had eight in the first half, I want to say. And, uh, Scott, I think you brought that up earlier. I, he he really uh, was one of the guys who was able to get going. He, he held it uh, together in the middle part of the first half before Whitman started to get hot. Um, and so I thought he, he played well that, you know, seemed to rack up a number of fouls late. I would totally agree with Scott that it, it seemed like, um, that last foul was, was a, a clean block, but he ends the game with 12 points and six rebounds. Uh, did foul out uh, as we talked about, but I thought just gave a real presence inside. And I thought he was able to flourish a little bit more by not having to guard Al Wood. Uh, as we talked about before, I thought that put him in a better position to be successful really on on both ends of the floor. And, and ultimately he's a guy that uh, while, while I finished third on the team in scoring tonight, you know, the way he turned things around for himself within this season has meant so much to this team being able to put this run together. So, you know, Chris thoughts on Landon, he's really the only guy who, who played a significant role tonight that we haven't touched on yet and uh, would be remiss if we didn't uh, give him some, some love for his play uh, both tonight and over the latter part of the season. I would, I, you know, if you look at if you go back to December and they go to the Rainbow Classic and they they barely beat a really bad Rutgers team and then they lose to Clemson and then they lose to Texas Pan American, who, you know, would lose four of their games to losing teams throughout the season. That that was the big moment where this team needed to have, you know, a, 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 one of those discussions about what's going to happen, what's going to have to happen. And Landon Turner's play during Big Ten started out kind of iffy, but then he surged toward the end of the season. And if you talk to any of the guys on the team, they will tell you that Landon's play is the reason why they won the game, and the reason why they got to uh, reason why they got to the title game is what I should say. I mean, go back to the last game against LSU. He has twenty points. He overpowers a much smaller LSU squad. I didn't expect Landon to be overpowering tonight because of James Worthy and Sam Perkins. Those two guys play much bigger than they are, and they're already big guys. I mean, I mean, Sam Perkins is so long. I mean, it was unbelievable how how long he played all game. But Landon played the way Landon expected. You know, I, he I, I was surprised to see him not coming up to the free throw line more when they were in that zone and kind of being that middle guy who could get the ball and have the ability to pass to someone who's more in an open position. But I thought, I thought he played really well defensively. Uh, you know, when they switched in the second half from when he, when he went away from Al Wood, I thought that was interesting. I think it was a better move to get him off of Al Wood and let Jimmy Thomas guard him. But I thought overall, I think he played as well as you can expect from from a guy, I mean, you know, he had six rebounds. He had the foul situations that we talked about already, but you know, he he made he had twelve points. He was perfect from the foul line. I I, I really think he played a very solid game um, as you expected to do because that's been his trend for the last month and a half. Yeah, I mean, really, it was in my mind. It was a story of three players who, who helped this team along. In the beginning part of the game, I thought it was Landon Turner. I thought his defense and you know those plays he made when when Indiana was down by six in the first half was there. You had Whitman kind of at the end of the first half, beginning of the second half, and then you had Isaiah kind of take it home. Everybody else obviously made good contributions, but Landon Turner to me was key in the beginning part, and he was so good defensively. Him and Ray Tolbert on defense was just, it, it, they could not, you know, you, you have Sam Perkins, you have James Worthy, you have a lot of great height on this UNC team and they could not exploit it. They were settling for mid-range jump shots because of the defense Landon Turner and Tolbert were playing. So yeah, I mean, T- Turner was great. Again, I would say like, you know, well, I know we're going to get to MVPs at some point and it probably all goes to Isaiah, but you know, Landon Turner and Whitman were two guys who held things over in the first half and the you know end of the first, beginning of the second um, so yeah, I think Landon Turner was fantastic tonight. Yeah, interesting. The the only other stats I wanted to hit were some of the defensive numbers for IU. They held North Carolina to twenty of forty seven from the floor, forty two point six percent shooting, forced nineteen turnovers that we talked about, and and 
Uh, you guys both brought up their defense inside. Worthy finishes three out of eleven, three of eleven from the floor, and even Al Wood, who who led North Carolina in scoring, had eighteen points, less than half of what he scored uh, in the first game of the Final Four when he had thirty nine and and was six of thirteen. So IU really made him work uh, for for anything that he got. He was one of the only guys that could score uh, much at all for North Carolina in the second half. And IU, uh, you know, again holds a, another opponent to fifty or fewer points. Gave up just 24 in the second half to North Carolina, and, and I thought the defense, in addition to the strong play from Isaiah, really set the tone at the beginning of the second half. Uh, any other stats jump out to you guys that we uh, that we haven't touched on? Uh, you know, you'd kind of like to see at times maybe some other ways to look at these stats. This box score is fairly simple uh, as you look at it. May it makes you wonder if maybe there's not another way we could uh, look at some of these numbers, but maybe in maybe in time. I just think, you know, both of these teams, you get, I mean, you look at how defense affect, you know, plays a role. You know, they, they talk about defense creating offense. Both these teams were about the same field goal percentage wise coming into the game. And Indiana shut down a, a UNC team and held them to 43% uh, for the entire game. And I think that, you know, you were expecting Alwood to have a good game. You probably weren't expecting him to have a record-setting performance like he did against Virginia where he scored 39. But I think that in many ways, if they could contain Al Wood and not let him go crazy, then Indiana felt good about winning this game. But I just think that the second-half defense, only allowing UNC to shoot 9 of 25 is just tremendous. And you expected this to come in at some point. And, and whether that was late in the first half or beginning of the second half when it really kind of began to show its momentum, it, you expected this Indiana team, which has ridden its defense all year, to finally show up, and it did. I mean, the only stat that I would point to, again, we've, we've hit almost everything else, but I, I do think it shows to the conviction of, of what Bob Knight does as a coach and the, and the values he believes in, that you have Ted Kitchell, who's our fifth leading scorer this year, um, you know, and, and the sixth place is, you know, three points for Jimmy Thomas a game. Kitchell's averaging nine points a game. He's averaging, um, where's the rebounds here? Um, three rebounds a game. He's averaging 27 minutes a game to take a starter like that and be like, Hey, you made three dumb fouls. By the way, you're sitting the rest of the game in the national championship game, your fifth leading scorer, a guy who normally gives you nine points. And then you go on to get down by like eight points, to North Carolina in the middle of the first half to not bring him back in. That shows that, you know, coach Knight has some hardcore values where he's like, this is, this is the way it's going to go. And I don't care what game we're in. This is the way I'm going to play it. Here's the other thing to add on to that, though, that shows you, and obviously, the trust that he has in Jimmy Thomas because he went, he had yeah. a great game against LSU. He had nine rebounds and came in in a similar position off the bench. And he comes in and leads the team with, a, with the assists uh, with eight. And, and clearly, you know, you're not going to get the, the offensive capabilities that Ted Kitchell has. But he knew that he was sending a message to Kitchell, but he knew that he could trust Jimmy Thomas. And that made the difference. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was definitely interesting. I think another thing you you like to see from Knight is that he found, you know, Thomas really played well toward the end of the first half and he stuck with him coming out of the locker room in the second half and he played the whole second half. So, uh, you know, I think just they eventually got to a point where they had a lineup out there that they felt comfortable with both offensively and defensively. And I'm not convinced that if Landon Turner doesn't foul out in the second half, that they don't just ride those same five guys the entire 20 minutes because ultimately the only sub that was made in the second half for IU was uh, when Risley came in uh, when uh, when Turner fouled out. So, uh, all right, we're, we're almost to game ball time. Now, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to influence anything. I know Knight was named the the guy on the broadcast, but I have acquired an advanced copy of Sports Illustrated, which does have Isaiah Thomas on it. Now, this is not meant to uh, you know to sway anyone's vote in a given direction. So, something to think about for you guys during the break. But Sports Illustrated, at the very least, uh, has dubbed him Hoosier Hero Isaiah Thomas for the champ. So, uh, you know, potentially more to come from there. Uh, I'll let you guys think about that during the break. Uh, and when we come back on the assembly call, we'll hand out our game balls. We'll talk about what age best the worst from the game, and then we'll try to put it into the proper historical context. That's all next here on the assembly call. Stick with us.
This is Nick Zeisloff. I never miss an open three, and I never miss an episode of The Assembly Call. You're listening to The Assembly Call IU Postgame Show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game, plus every Thursday night at our website, assemblycall.com. And while you're there, make sure you sign up for our free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 7,000 of your fellow IU fans have subscribed. You can also text IU to 66866 to subscribe to the newsletter. That's IU to 66866. I'm Andy Bottoms here with Chris Williams and Scott Caulfield, and we are talking about Indiana's national championship game victory over North Carolina. And now it's time for game balls. So uh, I jokingly talked about this going in. I did find it incredibly interesting, and I don't know that I'd ever seen it before, that as the uh, that as as the game got to a close, the broadcast team awarded the player of the game or whatever the Chevy MVP or whatever was to to Bob Knight. Now they they had talked about how before the game they had alluded to what a, a interesting like coaching matchup and that that would play a big role in determining the games. But I don't believe I've ever seen that uh, at any point since then. Uh, where where they named the the MVP? So we've never done that here. Um, given one to the coach, uh, I think we've we've joked about giving the coaching staff credit on different occasions, but I don't think we've ever given them a game ball. So uh, you guys can follow the lead of the broadcast team if you want, uh, but you don't have to. So uh, Scott, I'll throw it to you first. Uh, who gets your game ball from uh, the eighty one championship game victory? What's funny about them giving the game ball tonight, which I'm okay with, but it's like the end of the game, you know, McGuire and Packer start talking this weird story about how they, they had dinner with Knight, but Knight was being a dick and everyone thought he was yelling at them, but he wasn't. And it's like all these veiled, like, you know, a lot of people in the coaching community don't really, or a lot of people in the media don't really like Knight, but the coaches like Knight, like all these veiled ways of saying the guy's a dick. And then he wins the title. Like they won the title. Billy Packer's first question of the game. Billy Packer's second question after winning the title was about like their non fight they didn't have and why people were wondering. And Knight's like, yeah, I got no problem. Like, Knight's like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, the most bizarre thing. No question in my mind, Packer will be off the air in three years. No way that guy has a career in uh, announcing. Um, my game ball. You know, you have to mention Landon Turner. You have to mention Whitman. But to to me, the game ball goes to Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas did not have a good first half of the game. But when we got going, he was the one who got us going and pushed us ahead. And then when we, you know, there was some almost Harlem Globetrotter-esque moments near the end where the game's already out of hand, but he's just dribbling around and, like, nobody can get to him. And, again, I go back to his defense. To me, he's the key to our entire defense because having a guy who can basically play full help with anybody when his guy doesn't have the ball is just unreal. Like he was just darting down, coming back up. So to me, it's like kind of the easy answer, but I would go with Isaiah. Yeah, some of his anticipation plays on entry passes, or there was even one within the last like minute of the game where I think it was Doherty had been throwing the ball way down the court and he basically baited him into trying to do it again and stole the ball, I think, in the final minute. Uh, Chris, uh, what about you? Who gets your game ball? You know, as much as I'd love to give it to Jimmy Thomas and kind of be on the Jimmy Thomas train. And I have to mention the fact that, you know, it, it was ama- It's great that I had a trust in a guy like that to come in again and play another great game back to back, but you got to give it to the guy who's been the most, most athletic player to ever play for Indiana period. I mean, uh, it's, it's just, it's a no question because I, Isaiah does things on the floor that just make you shake your head and whether you're an Indiana player or you're on the opposing team. And I think that, you know, you expected him to come in uh, and, and rebound from that, that awful start offensively. But even then, you know, his second half was flawless. I mean, he had 19 of his 23 points in the second half. And I think what more do you need to say? Because his, his defense, he led the team in steals with four. Uh, I, I just think that, his second half was nearly flawless and it was the, it was the big reason why we're, we're hanging a fourth banner. Yeah. It was interesting that one of the shots he, one of the few shots he missed in the second half was he was kind of out in front of everybody. He took one of those patented pull-up jump shots. And then, you know, they talked about him, you know, clapping, being visibly frustrated with himself for missing, but yeah, he did, uh, did very little wrong in those two, those two stretch. layups he made, those two layups he made off the steals were just, picturesque beautiful i mean you know he just held himself up there for so long it was just it was 
glorious. Yeah, what they say on the on the broadcast, IU doesn't have a fast break. Isaiah Thomas is the fast break or something like that. So, yeah, I'll sure. uh, I would agree with you guys. I'll, I'll concur. I think his second half and the way he played to start the second half really put the game away for IU and put it to a point where North Carolina could never really come back. So, clean sweep in the game balls for Isaiah Thomas. So, all right, so now as we've been doing with these rewatches, kind of talking about what age the best and the and the worst. Um, and then we'll do some of the historical context. So I know Scott has a lot of questions. He said he had most of his stuff to fit into this segment. So we'll do the, uh, we can, we can speed through the age best and worst segment. I think on the worst side, Scott mentioned some of the camera angles, but my God, I mean, the overhead shot for a lengthy period of time. Then there was the one from the opposite baseline where you couldn't see half of what was going on. Uh, some of those things, but yeah, the overhead one was, was just awful. Um, so I don't know, I don't know how long those lasted before people, uh, got tired of it, but the, the camera angles were, were ones that I had. And then I wrote down a couple of the rules. So like the initial five seconds that led to another jump ball, uh, then it was funny cause my kids were upstairs and they came down and it was like, are they like, Oh, where's the game at? And I was like, it's getting ready to start the second half. And my nine year old is like, why are they having a jump ball to start the second yeah. half? And, yeah. uh, and then the, the technical for grabbing the rim on that play was, uh, was laughable as well. So I would argue none of those things aged well because so many of them have changed. Uh, but, uh, Chris thoughts on any of those or other stuff that you, that you saw that didn't age as well. A couple of things. The, the fact that at that time you still could not see the score on the screen that, I mean, we didn't talk about that, uh, in the 76 broadcast that we rewatched. We did either the fact that you had to, wait till the ball was bringing across, brought across half court to see a quick blurb of the score. That drove me nuts. You know, I think it would drive everybody nuts. The one thing that was interesting, and I don't know if I, I, I misunderstood what Al McGuire was saying, but he was arguing about the fact that the teams do not warm up when they come back. He argued about them sitting down for I heard, 20 minutes. Yeah, I heard yeah. that too, but I didn't know whether it was just like they did. It was funny because the last one that I – I, I, the last one of these that I did was like the 87 game where Tarkanian and UNLV is just like running out, but not purposefully not trying to warm up, just like didn't get out in time. Right. But yeah, this did seem odd. It, it, he almost seemed to allude to the fact that at the very least, North Carolina didn't warm up, but he didn't really, I couldn't tell whether it was like, was he saying that IU had warmed up and, and like that led to them getting the lead? I, yeah, I'm not sure. That was a I weird think he was conversation. To a rule change. I think he was alluding to some kind of NCAA rule because he talked about the fact that, y- y- you know, it, it just messes with the whole approach because you're sitting down for 20 minutes at half. I don't know. I, I misunderstood, but he was, you know, he was very vocal about that. And I thought about that as being very interesting. Those are the two th- big things that, that I noticed um, right away. Yeah. Scott, what about you? All right. Sorry, folks. Um, I got a couple things. So I know uh, if you're not a Crimson Cast listener, I apologize. You get to hear my voice for a little bit. Um, so and you guys jump in as I go through these. Um, I sang at the beginning the using this is it, the Kenny Logan song. I'm so happy we got off of that and went out a one shining moment. That was awful. Um, I didn't like them using the IU seal instead of the IU kind of logo. That was a bummer. Um, but, you know, the PA the announcer going University of Indiana, Indiana as they're getting yes. announced. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah. Not University of Surprise PA. There wasn't more some, things, in the crowd. some things never change, but yeah. The ads for the yellow pages and the RCA video disc the beginning was great. The intro package to the game, like this, this the I, I like it's like the first two or three minutes. It sounds like an '80s game show. It's just like it is. The production value is so bad. Like in the early '80s, production value is just so bad. How about um, Midas do, being your key sponsor? Yeah, I know Midas. There, there's one pick of a. And maybe it's because it's like, I don't know, like the, during like they were doing the flag timeout, but it looked like the, the, the male cheerleaders had the girl cheerleaders like fly. It was a weird like setup, but I also word that they were not at home. So oh. there's that. Um, we talked about Dick Emberg talking to Mike Pepper, um, but I was like, it was funny because like Dick Emberg, just be quiet. Like you're, you're a great, but like they're introducing the players. He has to say something about each guy. He's like yeah, trying every, to jam it in before they get to the next player. Every, every one of them. Yeah. My wife walked in, did, walked in the room during one of those. She's like, why does he feel like he has to say something after every guy gets announced? But yeah, the yeah. Mike Pepper one being um, the last one was, was honestly like the, the best because he's the last he guy to get announced. the spirit. Got the worst, the whatever, which player. is the exact opposite of anything that you do now where you like kind of rig it so that the last guy is going to be one that everybody else is like who the hell is this dude running out here and then he gets that comment from Enberg it was yeah that was fantastic we talked about all the, all the camera angles um here's some some great quotes from the uh the announcers uh Sam Perkins gets the ball on the break and Sam Perkins looks like a young Kevin Durant like I, I wrote he's like, this down the too. break 
like he gets the ball and the Billy Packers like big man can't run with a ball like that. Why would you pass him on a break? And I'm like, because he looks like Kevin Durant because like he's six ten, He's great with the ball. He's going to have a 10, an 18 year NBA career. Like it is just, and I, I get it like at the time, but it's just like, it's like how on earth can you pass it to this big guy? And then they, they go nuts too. They're like amazed. Like they are amazed that Isaiah Thomas got more than two rebounds. Like Isaiah Thomas got a rebound. Like what's a guard doing getting a rebound? Why are big men getting the ball? Like it is so stuck in the big men, small men era. It's insane. Yeah. I, I wrote down, I swear he quote, I swear Al McGuire actually said big men can't handle the ball. Like those yep. are the exact words out of it. Yeah. It was, it was pretty funny. Um, yeah. I, I grabbed that. Al one McGuire. Al McGuire somewhere in the game said sports are to be used and not to use you. The only important thing in life to win is surgery and war. So there you go by Al McGuire. Um, to, to your point, not only no score, I literally wrote down, like, can I get an effing clock anywhere on the screen? Like, it's just like, I could not keep track you, you of the game. Until time. It was under a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, great one. As a guy who used to work at B97 and did a lot of local radio, I enjoyed Dick Emberg on a national NBC national championship game, pausing for station identification. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> I like that. Um, Al McGuire talking about, um, I think it was, um, I think it was Al Wood or somebody going early in the NBA, but he's it's just, I love early broadcasting. It's like, he'll go early in the NBA draft, which is in May or June or sometime in the spring. I don't know. And it's like, <laughs> Good homework, Al. Like, way to do your homework. It's one of those. Yeah. Um, the last, that, last that two evolved, things I had. That eventually yeah. evolved into green room guys from ESPN. So maybe it was better when they didn't know. Who's to say? As opposed yeah, to, like, well, ramming some kind of manufactured thing down your throat. But, yeah, that, I heard that, too, where he was like, he's definite to go early whenever it is, basically. Yeah, when it may, June. Like, who knows? Um, all right, the last two things. Just a, a side note. Like, the end of this game is brutal. Like, the end of games this era are brutal. Like, it's everything that we hate about the end of end of games now, except it lasts for like eight minutes. Like it's like the, I literally like once it's like seven minutes to go, but like, there's no way that UNC can come back. Like, there's no possible way. It reminds me of I'm an indie indie car fan. It reminds me of the way people talk about like the Indy 500 from the 80s and 90s. Something Gail and I talk about. If you go back and watch those races, like most of them suck. Like they are like you know the the reason the little Al um, Scott Goodyear thing is such a big deal is because. It was like one of the few races ever that like there was a close race. Like normally guys are two, three, four leads, you know, uh, laps ahead. Everybody looks back on the things loggingly. If you go back and watch these old games, like it is just brutal. The end of the game is just like there's no way for anybody to come back. It's nothing but fouling. It was rough. Um, and then we'll end it with this. So <laughs> like we started with the this is it stuff. I love Dick Enberg just looking to the camera at the end and be like, I'm going to quote the song now. It's not up to me. It's not up to me this time. There comes a time in every life that this is it. And he's like talking about how this is important for not just the game, but for President Reagan. I'm like, I have no effing idea how like how that like, like good try, Dick. Like you're really trying to shoehorn that in. But it's just a weird quote to end on that. It's like, all right, this is it. We're out. So, <laughs> well, the other so the other thing from a, a basketball perspective was the. Uh, with no shot clock, just the ability to run the clock. I mean, basically, once Worthy foul got his third foul in the in the first half, yeah. Carolina ran like a good minute and a half off the clock, and IU did it late in the game uh, as well. But just some of those kinds of things. There's obviously a strategy to it, and IU even forced a, a turnover off of it when Carolina was trying to do it. They kept extending the defense so far, but just the like that contributes to the like that was why you had no alternative but to foul because if the other team was good yeah. enough to just hold on to the ball. They could, you know, three minutes left. We're just going to wing it around and uh, and and see how far we can get into the game. I also like when guys fouled out. Like today, they put like, oh, you know, fouled out, number of points, whatever. Both Landon Turner and James Worthy. It's just like the quote underneath that, or the the words underneath them are has fouled out of the game, and that was it. <laughs> Nothing else. It was so. I thought I, I noticed that as well. Um, all right, so that was a lot that did not age well from the game. Or. So it, did anything age well for you, uh, Chris? Oh, I'll, throw yeah. back to, uh, I'll throw it back to you. Oh, Chris. No, 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 go to Chris. Yeah. Yeah. I mentioned this in the 70, the rewatch we did for 76, <laughs> the uniforms still remain timeless. Uh, the, the jerseys, the, the uniforms, the shooting shirts, the candy stripes, that, 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 that little touch that, that night put on everything is still very much alive, which is great. Um, I thought it was agree, interesting. Agree a thousand percent. Like that, yes. that shade of red is just great. Like it's, those uniforms are fantastic. It's beautiful. 
Uh, the interesting thing, Al McGuire said something early in the broadcast about the difficulty winning your second title. And I, I kind of was chuckling because I was like, yeah, well, Al, you didn't win your second title. So you got that lone <laughs> one. But it, it is interesting because they talk about Knight being the sixth coach at that time to win his second title. But it is something if you go back and look about at, at you know, the, all the teams that won only one title, they're all obscure universities. They're all obscure teams. You have your LaSalle, you have your Wyoming, all these weird teams. But it's interesting about the fact that it is difficult even today. I mean, you have your perennial teams that do that, but you think about the teams like Virginia winning a national title. You know, when is is that something that's going to be coming easy again for Tony Bennett? It, it, you know, winning that second title is just such a difficult hurdle. And I, I thought that was interesting because I, I, McGuire was all over the place for me in, in this game. It was, it was hard to listen to him. But I thought that was interesting. The last thing that aged well for me was that amazing blazer that Dick Ember was wearing, which was that Hoosier red, which I thought was in fuego. It was beautiful. Yeah, that was that yes. was good. Yeah, McGuire was like there were points, you know, where he was kind of ahead of things on the on the Landon Turner grabbing the rim about, oh, well, he's trying to protect himself and whatever. And then there was just other just absurd. But then like two minutes later, it's oh, a big man can't handle the ball and whatever else it was. Yeah, he was just all over the place. The quotes that Scott him had about the about like faking, the surgery and war, faking contact, like faking a guy that didn't have, like yeah, lost a contact a, there, faking an injury and faking a, losing a contact. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Uh, Scott, what about you? What what aged well? I mean, so Brian Gumble, like still going, like still on HBO Sports, like thirty nine years later. Um, you look at this crew. I mean, we're joking about him, but like Dim- Dick Emberg was going until two thousand ten. McGuire went until two thousand. Billy Packer went until two thousand eight. Like. 28 years after this game, all those guys are still going. Don Fisher, who we didn't hear, was on the radio, is still on the radio now. Like, that is one thing I, I will just say all of us are, are in a similar generation um, age wise. You know, Gail and I went to school together. We were at WIUS. Like, this is what sucked about getting into sports radio and sports broadcasting the time I came out, which is why I went a different path. Is like, Everybody who was there, like, was experienced in the in the you know. If I wanted to get on there, it's like, well, I couldn't get Don Fisher's job because like he has been there fifteen years. No idea he'd still be there when I'm forty three years old. And, like Dick Enberg's still there. Like it's like once you got a job, like Brett Musburger, like you're just good. Like hey, I'm gonna have this job for the next forty eight years, whether I suck or not. Talking about context, um, <laughs> I loved the IU pep band getting the national anthem and the crowd singing it. I get it. Like it was a big night with the Reagan shooting and like they weren't sure if they're going to play the game or not. So just having the crowd sing it was great. Uh, we talked to Brett Randy Whitman a lot. Like go look at it. Like Randy Whitman played like I think 13 years in the NBA. He retired a year before Isaiah Thomas did. Like at the end of that game, if you were like, hey, um, Randy Whitman's going to basically play one less year than Isaiah in the NBA, you'd be like, all right, that's insane. But Whitman had a, had a really – Really good NBA career, Chris. You mentioned the Dick Emberg jacket. A thousand, like it's got to be mentioned again that, that Jack, and that's a, that's an ODIU. That's an IU guy, you know, calling the game. Um, I I did notice when they came out from halftime, they showed they showed the scoreboard of the Spectrum, and it said just no smoking in your seats, which is just a great like. <laughs> remember that, like it goes back to the movie Airplane. Like the, the half the jokes are about you know getting a smoking section, and my kids today would be like, "What? I don't." It makes no like who can smoke on a plane, but yeah, like there was a time where you could just smoke anywhere in the Spectrum. You just couldn't smoke in your seats. Um, I talk about McGuire. Last thing I'll say too is I loved. After we won the title, we played the alma mater song, you know, the Fran Japana song, not the pep song, or the, the fight song, which I, I, I've i always loved that song. And the only time it really ever gets played is in kind of the preamble to IU football games. They, they do the national anthem. They do uh, back home again in Indiana or they mix it up. And then they always do the when the band comes out, they always play the alma mater. And I, I've. I, I love that song, and I wish they would bring that back more into basketball. And I love the fact that after we won the title, that was what the band played initially and then went into the fight song. Yeah, I noticed that, too. That was, like, immediate. That was the first thing that they, that yeah. they played. And, and it's funny that you say that because I hadn't really thought of it that way. But, yeah, I mean, I remember that even from being, you know, eight years old going to IU football games and always remembering them hearing that and, you know, watching my dad who had – you know, been there, you know, singing the, and learning the words to that then, but you never hear that uh, from a basketball perspective. So yeah, I did notice that when yeah. they were and, going to that. I mean, it, I mean, they could have just went sorry, right into this last, is it had they learned that in time. Yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> and the, the last thing I'll say too, you know, Andy, you mentioned about night, you know, the, the thing that's interesting about night, cause I, the last rewatch that, that Chris and I did together with Jared was the, uh, the 2002 IU Kent state game. 
And it's like, it's, it's almost eerily weird. Like, let's just assume that team won the title. That would be like if then Dane Fife was coaching IU now and winning his second title. Like, that's how close removed Knight was to winning a title as a player in 1960. Like, as they're talking about it, it's like, oh, you know, Knight won in the 60s. And it's like, yeah, like in 1981, that was only 21 years ago. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit off, but, like, that would be like Dane Fife just now having two titles. Like, this young, it's just – it is nuts to think how close removed he was to being a player, to being, like, that good and being a two-time national champion with a undefeated team and basically a team that only lost one game in a season. Like, that's bonkers. Yeah, it was – and even to just you know, watch him a little bit on the sidelines, I know they talked about that a few times where like it was him watching a mini tennis match or some kind of you know weird thing that they, that they talked about the way oh, yeah, that, that he weird, was. That weird little cam of, of what, him, what night watching the game in the, in the box corner. That was yeah. crazy. Yeah, because it came up like right after, I, I forget whether it was Packer or McGuire said that, or like, oh, just we're just watching night. Well, then, you know, the next possession, uh, they, they've got him in there. But really, he was relatively subdued from an official standpoint, and nobody really – worked him too terribly much but he was you know he a, a couple times would get frustrated with some of the turnovers and things like that but uh, a couple defensive breakdowns but I, I've, it definitely felt like offensively he just had such a confidence in what this group of players was going to be able to do on the offensive end you just didn't really th- there were very few times outside of you know a turnover here and there that he really got up and talked to anybody about something that was going on uh, offensively and this was really just a, you could just tell it had gotten to be at a point where it was a team that he was really comfortable with. I think he alluded to that in some of the postgame uh, comments. Another thing that didn't age well, the the interview for anybody who stayed on and watched like with Whitman and Isaiah Thomas was arguably like nothing was actually said or really asked at any point. It was, it was awful. And it actually, it was like, you got nothing out of them. And I know sometimes you don't get a lot out of players, but you didn't, in this case, you didn't get anything out of the players because you didn't really ask a question. At all. Yeah. It was just a really odd interaction. It's like, uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. And then, it, like you're waiting for the, the players yeah. to actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, and was, then wasn't, I, I remember that. And then wasn't Whitman like, kind of like, hey, can I say something? Like, yeah. He's like, I want to say hi to all my friends back home. It's like, Isaiah, you had to I, ask Isaiah permission for that? Like, yeah. <laughs> Isaiah was the one that wanted to, yeah, kind of say hello to his family. That was, it was just weird. And I think yeah. the one yeah. thing. They're probably like, well, hell, if you're not going to ask a question, I might as well just say hi to people. <laughs> not I'm on camera. Well, the one thing about that is that the player you're asking the players in the moment of just winning the national title, and some of them they they can't even be thinking straight about what's just happened. And I think that was that there was that awestruck moment for both of them. And I think that you know, yeah, the, the questions were bad, the responses were bad, but I think in that moment, you know, women said it hasn't sunk in yet. I just think that they just couldn't comprehend exactly yeah. the moment because they were just overcome with with emotion. Yeah. So, all right. So now, now we'll try to do this some historical justice. And I know Scott, you said you had some questions. So, uh, you know, a couple quick things just by way of of talking through this. So, you go to the next season. Uh, at that point, you know, Tolbert was the only guy set to leave. Isaiah, Isaiah Risley, Lee, Risley graduated, and and Risley did. Sorry, was the only starter. Uh, Risley oh, yeah. graduated. Then Isaiah goes pro. Landon gets in the car accident, and you really. At that point, the following year, your your top three are Kitchell, Whitman, and then Jim Thomas moves into a, a larger role from a scoring perspective. Uh, and then you had Uwe Blob come in, uh, Steve Bushi. Those were your top five scorers on that. So for all the positivity of if everybody comes back, that's supposed to come back. And I, it, it's hard to really it, – it's hard to envision a scenario where there was – strong belief that Isaiah would come back based on what he had accomplished. But it, it's hard to kind of put yourself in that, in that moment, information was different, all those kinds of things. But, you know, you close out the game, if everybody comes back that has eligibility compared to what actually did happen was a pretty big, uh, a pretty big change. And in, in the circumstances of some of that uh, with, with Landon's car accident and, and paralysis were, uh, were tragic. It, just a, a kind of weird, moment and and as you start to kind of think about how you put that into what that did to the tra- potential trajectory of the program heading into that um 81 82 season so chris i'll kind of throw that to you first just to kind of talk through you know what that what those losses meant moving forward based on what you could have thought reasonably coming out of this game well i mean if you look at you know what happens and kind of that range from 
from 81, 82 until they win in 86, 87, you, you don't have a consistency of, you know, you have the 83 big 10 championship, obviously. But if you look at that 81, 82 team, you're putting Jim Thomas in a role of having to be a reliable scorer, which is not something that he has been accustomed to doing. You, you, obviously you have Whitman and Kitchell for two more years. It seems like Kitchell is like an eight year player by then, but you know, his injuries obviously have played a big role in that, but Besides Kitchell and Whitman, you didn't really have anything reliable in 81-82. I mean, Uve was still raw. Uve couldn't catch the ball. Uve's footwork was, you know, Uve's footwork. But I I think, to me, that 81-82 is one of those seasons where you see one of the biggest drop-offs after a title game. I mean, you could argue 87-88 was was a huge drop-off. But, I mean, 76-77, you still have Jim Wisman. You still have Ken Benson. But with 81-82 – I just think that there was so much dysfunctionality and obviously they depended on we were expecting Landon to be coming in and to be a guy that could be a big 10 player of the year caliber caliber player. They were talking him up so much big 10 season. And obviously during the tournament, you talked to, you heard the guys on the announcer announcement talking about how tremendous a player was that Landon was, even though he's not always in the spotlight. I think that changed the whole momentum of what was to come those next three years especially obviously you're not going to have Landon, but one more season, but as a senior Landon was expected to be infinitely even better than he, what he was in 80, 81. And this is a guy who was the, on the all tournament team for the final four in, in the NCAA tournament. So I, I think that, you know, you have the bright spot in 83, which, which is one of those, if you, if you know a lot about this historically, and if you were in assembly hall, um, it, you know, any time in the last 20 years, you remember seeing that lone banner that was there that sig- signified that Big Ten t- championship. That's the one that Bob Knight alluded to as the fans willing the team to win in 83. But, you, you know, it's interesting what happens in those early 80s, you know, because it, it kind of transitions and transcends everything to some mediocrity with, with some of the teams, obviously the 84, 85 team that, that did not bode well, well and didn't even make the tournament. Um, it, it just, it's so interesting to see because you know that if you're going back to 80, I'm kind of going all over the place, I know, but if you go back to 80, 80 81, 82, without, even without Thomas, you know, the, the, the huge loss and obviously the tragedy of what happened with Landon set in motion a lot of having to expect a guy like Steve Bushi and, and Uve to play roles that maybe they weren't accustomed to being ready to play. Yeah, Scott, uh, I know you said you had some historical things, so I don't know if going through that touched on any of them or if there's a different direction you want to take it, but uh, I'll, I'll throw it to you. No, it did. I mean, and that's, I think, the question. And Jeff Marlowe in the chat mob brought that up, too. Kind of the question about, you know, if if Isaiah Thomas and Landon Turner come back, you know, what does 82 look like? That Chris hit that really well. That was the question I was looking at. I kind of took that from a different angle. Um you know, I, I think first off, it's a lot of variables you're asking. You're asking for a guy who's had no reason to come back to IU to come back and Isaiah Thomas, and then obviously a tragedy with Landon Turner. But I look at it as kind of a little bit differently that, you know, we we look at that, you know, Calvert Cheney stretch as like there was a couple of years there where I feel like we could have gotten that, you know, if Henderson doesn't get hurt, maybe we win Cheney's senior year. You know, the, the junior year, that team was really pretty good. Maybe if they don't hit Duke, we, we hit there. You know, that 76 team had a nice run. As I look at this, you know, I look at if let's just assume Isaiah and Landon Turner come back the next year. I think the landscape of basketball is really changing. I'm not sure it's to IU's favor in that, you know, you're moving forward next year. That UNC team adds Jordan. I mean, that team is just dynamically fast, big. They're playing Georgetown with Patrick Ewing. You got five slam a jamma in there in, in Houston. I mean, basketball got really athletic, really fast, really big, really quick. And even if you add, you know, have Isaiah Thomas and Landon Turner, like you still have Uve, Uve Blob as Chris. Like, I, I'm not so sure that IU team. Yeah. I, I Uve honestly think does not come of, in and replace what Tolbert did the year before. Right. Tolbert would have been better. I, I honestly think this is one of those things where, like, this was our window. Like, this was our year. Like, let's say Isaiah and Landon Turner come back. I don't think we're better than North Carolina or Georgetown that next year. And so I, I, I think this was the window to get it done. And they, they capitalized on the perfect year to get it done that, that year. So I look at it that way. I will, I have a question for, for Chris or Andy, either of you, but it's something Galen's talked about, you know, Knight kind of in that era too, after 81 to 87 kind of had a couple times where he looked at leaving Indiana, whether it was to get leverage to become the all powerful God that he became in Bloomington. We'll never know if he was really serious, but 
Gail's always talked about, like, you know, if Landon Turner doesn't get hurt, Knight might have just left. And one of the reasons Knight stayed is because Landon get hurt. Um, like, Chris, can you – I'm just curious to talk about that. Like, do you think there's any validity to that, that, you know, Landon Turner's injury is what kept Knight from kind of wavering off to do something else? You know, I don't know. I, we, you know, obviously we know so, that Landon was very important to Knight because Knight did so much for Landon in terms of raising money. They had, you know, uh, they had celebrity scholarship golf classics for him and they raised a lot of money to assist him. And I, and, you know, it, it's one of those things that you can say what you want about Knight, but he's always there to help out, you know, his players and especially in a, in a circumstance like this. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I've heard, you know, whether it was to New Mexico or whether it was to someplace else, you know, the hypotheticals around night, what it would have done for the program in general is, is very interesting because who, who comes in to replace that? Do you, do you get a former player? Do you get, do you get someone who's Al McGuire? Yeah. Yeah. You get Al McGuire, <laughs> but it, it is interesting because I, I have talked to some people who were around at that time that said, you know, if night leaves, you know, you, you, you bring in a, a former player that, you know, in the early eighties, you bring in somebody like Quinn Buckner, you know, who yeah. had done some coaching at the, in, in, in the NBA. Who, I don't know if he was still, well, actually he would have still been with the Celtics then. So that, that, but, but, but something like that, a, a former trusted yeah. player that Knight gets to handpick, you, you know, who knows, who knows, do you go in that direction? Do you go, you break off from the, the Knight family uh, mindset completely, but I don't know. I don't know if, if Landon's circumstance necessarily shapes what Knight wants to do, but it, it, you know, it certainly, you, you know, is something that to that we could com- continue to ponder because it, it definitely tra- changes the whole mindset of what happens with eighty one, eighty two. Because a lot of people look at that as a what if circumstance, even if it's not a national title. That's a team, even with Landon, with Landon and without Thomas. That's definitely a team that could go deep in the tournament. Yeah, I mean the other hypothetical going backwards that I always like I I and even the more I dug into this, like I look at it again. I think the landscape of college basketball is different. I think eighty moving forward, I don't think we win another title. But I always look and I'll open this to you guys because I don't know as much about that era between like seventy six and eighty one. But I always look at the big hypothetical is the you know. Larry Bird is on the team, doesn't, you know, he leaves. I don't think there's a way you keep him there, but like just hypothetically Bird stays on. Like you look at 78, 77, 78, the team went 21 and eight second in the big 10, 78, 79, where Bird took a team with nobody on it to the final game. We went 22 and 12. I'm just curious if Bird's on that, like it, do we get t- another title or two in there? And then how does that change the trajectory of basketball? Like to me, that's always been the one hypothetical that I think isn't talked about enough. Cause I think you could be looking at, you know, possibly four titles in like six or seven years. If you have Larry bird on the team. Well, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of scenarios. I mean, it, you know, and, and I'll get to that in just one minute, but if you go back to, you think about if George McGinnis stays another year and he plays with Steve Downing and that team goes to the final four in 73 and they don't lose to UCLA. What happens then? I mean, that's the, and McGinnis, obviously after the fact, you can say anybody in that situation could say, I regret my decision of leaving, but yeah. you know, but with bird that 76, 77 team that had uh, you know, so much, so many new players coming in, you, you had very little, you, you have Wayne, Wayne Radford, you have Jim Wisman and you have Ken Benson. If you had another scorer, it's a possibility that things could change dramatically. You don't have really have a, a very, you know, dynamic guard on that 76, 77 team. But if you look at that 79 team that had, um, that had Landon Turner, that had um, a, a, a Ray Tolbert, you know, those kinds of guy, you know, that kind of situation, that team that, um, y- you know, that, that went to the NIT and beats Purdue, you know, that's, that's a big one to think about because, of just what, you know, and this is one that everybody, every Indiana fan likes to think about the what if with bird could it mean two more titles. It, it's a great question. Um, it would, would not have been willing to let allow bird to kind of run things on the floor or be, yeah. the, be that dynamic score or be that dynamic player the way he did with Isaiah. That's a great thing to consider. But I mean, you know, there's just so many things. I, I don't know if bird would have been willing to accept all the things we not, one of the things we talked about in the last show was the fact that in, if you look at between 70, the 76, 77 season and it, you know, in 79, 78, 79, you have 11 players for Indiana transfer relief. 
11 players wow. leave the team or, 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 or transfer. And so there, there was some rockiness, and you had a lot of guys came, that would come in that couldn't adjust to what Knight wanted to do. And you could see that there wasn't the stability, there wasn't the team leadership in a lot of ways that you saw with a Quinn Buckner and you saw with a, an Abernathy or Jim Cruz. That, those kinds of players were not there, and that's what made 76 so unique and why the teams that came after that are a lot of them are just teams that you, you don't think about as being prolific teams in any way. Well, yeah. and then, and then if Bird was there, I'm trying to think who else this like that would have overlapped in some ways with Woodson, right? And then it kind of yeah, Woodson, yeah, I I totally forgot about Woodson because so, he would have been there, yeah, yeah. So then I think it becomes interesting. I mean, we've the one thing that's been somewhat consistent with a lot of these rewatches is you know whether it's the eighty, you know, I've done the eighty seven one where Alford was obviously the focal point, and then the the ninety three uh, where it was Cheney. And some of those kinds of things. And it's, you know, what kind of situation does it set up? Like, can you find ways to make things work with Bird and Woodson or is somebody being asked to take a role that maybe they don't feel comfortable with? So I think that's where, and I don't think it's as much today. There's, there's so much of recruiting now that's like, well, this guy doesn't like this guy or doesn't want to play with this guy or is getting blocked by that. Like, I don't, I mean, I can only assume that those kinds of things weren't necessarily as big of an issue at that period of time, but you would have had some of that, you know, kind of role acceptance that you'd see on some of these teams. We talked about Jim Thomas tonight of the guy just being willing to come in and rebound and, um, and, you know, dish out assists and do whatever, but not be worried about scoring. And then how the, the things that transpired after the 81 season led to him having to assume a role that he maybe wasn't ready for, wasn't comfortable with or things like that. So that's, that's the hard part about some of those hypotheticals is you try to plug a guy in on a roster and figure out like, would that have, changed in that era who would have even been there to begin with and if it and, and even if it didn't um what does that mean with how you know roles and shots get distributed between a couple of those guys and whether they can play well together but it's certainly fun to think about like if you've got all these nba talents um that that had you know successful nba careers somehow being together if you could make them all coexist in a in a usable way then you 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 could certainly make the argument you could have had a couple more titles in that in that stretch. Well, and I think the point that Chris made is, is really good that, I mean, and I, I'm, I'm as guilty of it too, is looking at bird and be like, well, you plug him in. Like he's, he's great. Like he does. And birds, one of those guys too, where it's like, I think there's some guys that would be better under a system or not like birds, just a, obviously like one of the five best players of all time. Like he would have been good no matter what, but I, I think it's a hard hypothetical, even though I brought it up, like just because I just don't think at that point, you had Isaiah Thomas and it took night 18 months to get to a point to be like, all right, I'll give you some of the range of the offense. Like coming off of 76, I just don't think Knights can be like, all right, you know, Larry, just go, go. I mean, cause Larry just kind of ran the offense at Indiana state. Like he was LeBron. When yeah, he was basically you, the coach you made a great the point. Like, there was nobody Knight else wouldn't on that do team that. besides him. There was yeah, nobody Knight, else there. Knight would not have done that. Like there's yeah. just no universe where Knight's going to allow that, allow someone to play his own system and not Knight system. Especially, exactly. especially in the immediate aftermath of experiencing such great success with that system, like there's really no reason at that point to to bend he's, and say, yeah. and, and you know, he's also at that point, you know, already you know younger, but still the hard headed mentality that would be part of what he was throughout. But yeah, I mean, at that point, you're sitting on top of the world. You've had two of the best seasons that anybody's had over the course of time. For you to say I'm going to go adjust this because of this one player yeah. was just I, I yeah I just don't know that that was a marriage that at that time, based on what had happened, could have ever really worked based on personalities, philosophies, whatever you, whatever you want to say. All right, uh, so I think we're we're running relatively long, so we'll uh, we'll kind of stop the historical context stuff there. Uh, reminder that uh, we've got one more of these left, although we may continue them into the off season. We'll we'll sort through that after. But one of the one more planned one left at least. Uh, so IU Syracuse is Sunday night, the 1987 championship game. That'll be Jared Coach and Galen. Uh, Coach will be reliving uh, what he can remember of being at <laughs> IU during that time. So that'll be fun. Uh, I've heard a couple of those stories, so that should be good. Uh, Notes here, no banner Monday uh, this week, and then Thursday we'll be back with Assembly Call Radio, and then we'll figure out uh, if, how, uh, what games we want to do to kind of continue uh, some of this series as we go into the off season. So uh, with that, uh, one last reminder that because you're an Assembly Call listener, you get 20% off of your entire order at homefieldapparel.com with the promo code ASSEMBLY20. 
And if you want to find a great deal on the most comfortable and unique IU apparel that you'll find anywhere, make sure you go to homefieldapparel.com and use the promo code assembly20 for that 20% off. And uh, with that, we'll do our last call here. Uh, Chris, I'll throw it to you first. Uh, Final thoughts on IU's 1981 championship victory. Well, you know, at the time it was the, they like to call it the losingest NCAA champion at, uh, at, with nine losses, but uh, it, it just shows you what that team was capable of. And, and Knight talked about the fact that it was all about perseverance from a seven and five record. Um, you know, it was one of the, the worst, uh, you know, preseasons records that Indiana had ever had under Knight, but you knew the pieces were there and they just had to fit in the right way. Uh, and everything kind of complimented himself because if you look at it, I, I can't think off the top of my head of a team that went through an NCAA tournament as dominant as they did in terms of their, you know, they right off the gate, they beat a really good Maryland team, just destroyed them. Um, to me, it's one of those tournaments you think about uh, and, and you, you look at just how good the team was. And, but you look at the record and you say to yourself, they, ha- they just had to have time to figure it out. And that's classic of a night team to get things figured out at the right time and, and get the, all the thing, all the pieces moving in the right place, which they did. And it was, it was a great game to watch. And it was glad, I'm glad to see, you know, Isaiah doing what Isaiah does as, as good as anybody in IU history. Scott, final thoughts. Yeah. I mean, it, this was, I've actually not, I hate to say it as an IU fan. I've, I had not watched this entire game before. So this was an absolute delight. Like to me, my memory of the game is always like that Chris mentioned, like that Isaiah, just the, the iconic image of him going in for the layup and just, you know, gliding in there. So it was really fun to go back and watch it. Like Landon Turner really stood out to me. I was like, Jesus, this guy is just a specimen. Like he looked so good. Um, and I mean, just it, it's it's awful what happened to him. And I remember thinking like his last play, just like that's the last play of his basketball career. Some ticky tack fifth foul it sucks for so many different reasons. But, you know, the, if you listen to like any of the ringer feeds, like they do like the rewatchables, they always talk about, you know, like who's at their peak. You can't say this was Knight's peak because Knight's peak has to be 76. But like this is damn close because he's he's on his game. And I've always thought of Knight as kind of like like, you know, nuclear half-life, like we, we've talked in many of these podcasts, like he has this ability to do, put together a great team and then kind of stops recruiting for a couple of years. But like, this was one of his shortest half-lives. You go to 76 to 81, just like, boom, gets it. 81 to 87 is a little longer. 87 to 93 is a little bit longer. Then it's like, then it's just like the half-life kept on going, couldn't get back there. Um, but you saw Knight evolving as a coach here too. Like he, 76 was the best team he ever put together. 87 was also a really good team built around one tool in, in all for maybe 75. I see Chris shaking his head, but th- this was the, you know, Isaiah was the best basketball talent that came through Knight that Knight ever had in his hands. I mean, there was other guys who were really good. Shaney might've been a better overall college player, but like, Isaiah is just a stud. I mean, Isaiah is just amazing and obviously had a great career. Like Isaiah was, and you saw Knight realizing like, okay, I have something special here. I have to change some of the ways that I'm coaching. And you saw as this season progressed, you saw it with this team. Um, so it was, you know, it's, it, it's, it's great. And again, it's a bummer that like, we're not like, it's just the, the grip that we took on basketball at this point, you know, with having the only what was like only the sixth coach to win multiple titles coaching in Indiana. We have four titles. We're like third now of all schools at that point with three, you know, with four titles. We have just won two in like six years. Like we are we're just unstoppable at this point. And it's just it's again, these rewatchables have been awesome. It just sucks. to be Like, why can't we be there? Um, but anyway, no, I, I will say this is my last one. I have had an absolute blast these have been an unbelievable delight thank you to anybody um for for listening and watching and tuning in um i know we appreciate it but this has been it's been my honor to do these These have been so much fun so i appreciate you guys hosting these and getting these on there because this has been an absolute blast i agree i meant to say that too thank you very much Oh no, it's been uh it's been our pleasure and kudos to Jared as always for coordinating everything and uh yes. it, it's definitely been fun to 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 watch some of these and I think this is a team that um that I'm like Scott I had I I think I'd watched this game once I watched it really a- once even le- you know, I watched it once before this week and then uh kind of watched it in bits and pieces leading up to this game and and watched it along with everybody tonight uh but but a fun team to, to really go back and listen to the story of, and I think I forget what show it is on big 10. I think it's like a big 10 elite, I think is the show and they've done one uh, on this team. And it was, I have watched that a couple times 
and just to go through and kind of see that transformation of guys figuring it out and figuring out their roles, watching Knight be able to adjust and, and give Isaiah a little bit more freedom uh, and things like that. And then just to see it start to click in such an amazing way down the stretch, that tournament run where, I mean, this was the closest game they played the entire tournament and it was a double digit game, almost the entire second half. Uh, just the way this team could really turn it on and, and, and play so well after starting poorly, it's one of those that I think is in some ways good for fans to watch now. And uh, we're so used to being on here and kind of living and dying with every game and things don't get off to the start that you wish that they would. Um, but just to be able to see that a team, when you know the pieces are there and you've got somebody coaching who knows how to change them around enough um, and, and guys really buy in to what they're doing, um, you don't need to wait another season or recruiting cycle or whatever else it is to be able to really turn things around. Uh, and this was just a great example of a team that was, you know, as low as any IU team in, in the night era to that point, at least since, you know, the teams had really started to get good. You know, Chris rattled off some of those losses um, to really be able to bounce back from that is a, a testament to uh, the coaching staff and, and the players being able to really recenter themselves and, and move forward into the season. And fun to watch Isaiah, a guy that, uh, you know, I watched so much growing up as a, a Jordan fan and those Bulls Pistons games and kind of seeing him in that incarnation. Uh, but being able to go back and watch him here where like you can just, even if you didn't know what he was going to become, like you could watch this game and be like, that guy has it. Whatever it is just made everything look easy, was so smooth from a ball handling standpoint, um, took over when he needed to, um, and and just was a, a fantastic watch. I mean, even as a sophomore in college, could just tell he was a guy that was going to be a stud in the NBA, and he was just that. So fun to kind of watch him at his peak. Um, and then, you know, the Landon Turner, uh, Scott, as you mentioned, everything about what happened to him uh, ha has been sad and a story that IU fans have passed down just about everything that's happened. We talked, touched on the way that Knight really uh, embraced him after that, because I think of what the two of them had been through to get to the point where he was playing as well as he was uh, in this season. So uh, Landon is, is probably a guy, anybody who's heard him talk would not be one to want anyone to dwell on that. And he's really made uh, a, a lot out of a situation that many of other people would have, uh, would have struggled with, which is not to say that he didn't struggle with it, but has really, um, been such an advocate for IU basketball and, uh, just a, a great Hoosier since then. So good to see him playing so well in this big game. And, uh, while the last play may not be one that, you know, he wants to think about as his last play, that last game, uh, certainly is. So, uh, a positive memory in that regard. And, and I'll echo what you guys said. I'm, uh, Jared and I swapped, so I won't be on the 87 game, but, uh, this has been, this has been a lot of fun, something that we've all talked about doing for a while and glad we, uh, we finally got to do it, albeit under not the best circumstances, but uh, we'll figure this out. I know we've all batted around ideas about other games that we might want to do, so we'll figure that out uh, after this run of these comes to a conclusion and uh, and go from there. But uh, So I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up with there. Everybody uh, have a happy Easter. Uh, we'll be doing the IU Syracuse 1987 rewatch that night, so hopefully uh, a number of you can join us then. Uh, or at least uh, check it out later on the podcast. And uh, thanks to Chris and Scott for joining me tonight. And uh, thanks, everybody, for, for joining us. And, uh, again, happy Easter. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll talk to you soon.